All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Technically Speaking Season 2. I'm su super excited about the lineup we've got coming for you this year, starting off with this first episode on implementing business systems and business goals. Uh, to kind of get us started here, just a quick introduction to Technically Speaking before we get into our topic. Again, my name is Brandon Burton. I'm the Senior Principal of Industry Relations here at CoreLogic and the Chair of the ANSI IICRC Standards. And I know we've really focused a lot on the technical content through 2022. Uh, this year, we're going to bring a lot more technical content, but we're also going to mix in a lot of business content as we go, uh, which really sets us up for today's presentation and where we're going to begin. And to kind of get us started here, I first want to introduce our first ever guest presenter here on Technically Speaking, Scott Severe, a good friend of mine and the Senior v Vice President of Alliances and Integrations here at CoreLogic Protect, and somebody that I know is very passionate about bringing the most out of business. So Scott, welcome to Technically Speaking. Thank you, looking forward to it. So we're, we're gonna approach the topic today of implementation of business systems and goals. And as we get into this, I, I kind of want to set the stage here a little bit for the context of what we mean by implementation. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of things that we can talk about technically with a business in terms of, especially, you know, in restoration of how we technically accomplish the work that we do in the field. But if the business behind that work isn't set up properly and, and we aren't effectively executing against that business, then it doesn't matter how technically accurate we are in the field. I've seen you know, some of my, my dearest and closest friends in this industry really struggle as a business, even though they're excellent at drying buildings or restoring structures or remediation, even though they've got it down and, and they can dry a building with their eyes closed, they really struggle as a business. And, and a root, root part of that is just understanding how important implementation of, of good, solid business systems and goals are. So for that reason, I'm super excited to have Scott with us because, Scott, I know this is an area of passion for you. Yeah, I, I, uh, I love it. I'll give you a little bit about my background. Um, used to remodel basements. Pretty much everything I did was either sales related or construction related. Um, and after Hurricane Andrew, we went out to Florida and did disaster repair. After that, I uh, went to Exact, where I was employee number 42 there. Saw a lot of growth in that company. Um, in 2006, went and started um, a company with some friends. Um, did three different companies during that period. Uh, 2010, we started Client Runner, which was a uh, competitor to Next Gear's Dash product and competed pretty strongly there for a while. And uh, we were acquired by Next Gear in uh, 2015. And then we did over the next three and a half, four years, we did four more acquisitions. And uh, so I've seen a lot. Uh, we got a, a lot of friends that uh, take me to lunch and ask me questions. Not that that uh, gives me uh, any curriculum background, but uh, it, it is a passion for me. I think running a business is, is hard. And uh, if you've come up through the ranks, a lot of times you're wearing the tool belt and then you go to bigger and better things and all of a sudden you're running a business and relying on other people. Yeah, and you know, you and I, we crossed paths when you were with Client Runner. I remember at the time I was with Legend Brands, and uh, I at the time was you kind of first making my first break and into an entirely new part of the industry uh, yeah. with software and and uh, and helping businesses begin to implement a software system. And that's what really opened my eyes to just how important because I'd spent most of my career really just focusing on the technical, right? I was a trainer. I, I, you know, I, I focused on applied structural drying training. Uh, in fact, I recognize several of the names in our attendee list today as, as go, going through class with me. So um, that was really my area of focus, almost to a vacuum. Uh, and, and you were a big part of really opening my eyes into understanding just how important the business systems are you know, behind that technical. So uh, super excited to have you with me today. Thank you, Scott. Awesome. So with that, let's kind of start off with the first concept here, and uh, something that uh, Scott and I have talked a little bit about is is this phrase, and I've, I've kind of put the phrase, don't be a lemming on it, uh, because that's what it reminded me is, of as we talk through it. But the, the statement I want to kind of throw out there and have us talk through is, you know, just because something is typical doesn't necessarily mean it's best practice. And and the way I want to stand that up first is I'll, I'll take it from kind of the technical slant, um, you know, 
you know, being involved in standards for as long as I have with ANSI and the ICRC, we always get into these debates uh, within these consensus bodies about, you know, whether or not if something's common in the industry, does that mean, mean it needs to become the standard of care in industry to kind of give it a technical slant? And that's not always true, right? Just because everybody does it doesn't mean it's the right way to do it. Um, and for that reason, you know, the standards, they do a really good job of defining what standard of care is. They say that standard of care is what is common among reasonably prudent and qualified members of the trade. They really stand up what that means. So common by itself doesn't mean it's the right way to do it. And we'll show you some numbers here in a little bit to stand that up even further. But Scott, I wouldn't mind you expanding on this just a little bit. And, you know, being careful, you know, if I were to throw this at you as a, as a question, you know, how can a business be careful to identify the difference between what's common what's, and what's really good and healthy for the business? So there's there's tensions that you have in different directions you want to go. And most people are looking around to see who's doing it well. You've heard the, heard the mm -hmm. advice forever. Find out who's doing it best and emulate them. And that's that's kind of good. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of truth to that. Um, Sam Walton started Walmart. He was famous for being out in the stores. He had an old Ford pickup truck and uh, would drive around. And his whole mantra is listen to the customer. The customer is always right. Customer, customer, customer. And I think that that's important to do. But if you talk to Henry Ford, he said, if I listened to my customer, I'd have built a faster horse. Sometimes you need to bring some stuff. You need to bring some innovation. So I think the first step is knowing who you are um, as a yeah. person and knowing who you are as a company. Where do you want to go? What are you trying to become? And focus your goals and alignment on that. So a lot of companies will do visioning, mission statements. Those are usually three to five years plans. Um, mm. It's okay to talk to other people and find out what they're doing. But at some point, you've got to know what you want. First step is what kind of company are you? Are you a lifestyle company? Meaning I've got 10 years left. I'm making good money. I'm going to slowly let this thing tail off, but uh, I don't want to be active in the business right now. Or I'm trying to grow the business. I'm in a really high growth stage or hey, I'm prepping it to sell. So for the next year or two, we're going to really focus on the metrics that are going to help us you know, get those multiples up. Or maybe you're going to transition to a family member. And so you're looking at how do we, how do we make that happen in a, in a good way? So you got to know First of all, who you are. Otherwise, you're going to be like a boat with uh, without an anchor and you're just going to shift around. So you drop that anchor down, it lets you sit there for a while and do stuff, but then you can pull mm -hmm. the anchor up and move. It doesn't mean that you can never have change. Um, so I, you definitely should watch the market, watch what people are doing, but you can't be a lemming. If you're a lemming, you're going to just adopt what someone else is doing and probably not even do it well because you don't know why they're doing what they're doing. Yeah, you know, and, and as, as you were talking, uh, Scott, I thought of another technical twist to put on this, and I'll, I'll try to put these. I'm surprised. Go. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised. Uh, but, you know, one of, one of the things, I always have this this persona of the technician in my mind. It's just burned into my head. Um, and, you know, one of the things that crosses my mind is, is as a technician, one of the challenges that, that I would face is, you know, often a business gets into a rut of typical practice. And, and thinking that the way something needs to be done on the technical end of the business is just the way it's always been done. Um, and, and I think that that's a, a really scary place to be, whether we're talking about business planning, business strategies, business goals, or even technical work in the field. Just because something has been done a certain way doesn't mean that we want to continue to do that way for all time. Uh, and for those that have been in the, in the industry for long enough, you can reflect on you know, kind of the ways in which we operated our businesses 20 years ago and just how different the industry is today, um, whether, again, from the technical side or even the business planning side. It is an entirely different world. Uh, the expectations on a business are entirely different. And when you go into thinking about your business processes, your business systems, it's really important to take a step back and remove the paradigm of believing that you are that business or you are that process or you are that product even that you were 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, because that can put you into that lemming rut, right? Uh, and and prevent you from really growing with the way that the industry is changing. I'm going to take a quick note, by the way, I forgot in housekeeping to mention, in Zoom, there is an area for you to post questions. Uh, so please take a quick opportunity, find, uh, if you're not familiar with Zoom, find the little question queue, it should be in the top menu bar, it might be at the bottom, depending on how you're joining. Um, and 
open up that question queue so that as Scott and I are talking at any point, if you've got a question, you can drop that question in. Uh, those that have attended previous technical speaking sessions with me, uh, typically we hold all the questions to the end. We're not going to do that today. Uh, today, because uh, Scott and I are working together to present this, I'm going to throw the questions out real live and in time as the questions come in. Uh, so please drop them in as soon as you've got them. Don't hesitate, type them in, and I will keep an eye on those questions and throw those questions at Scott uh, as they come. So uh, please uh, open up that, that questionnaire, if you would, please. Uh, so kind of transitioning this into, you know, don't be the lemming, don't do what's typical and just assume that that's best practice. Let's talk a little bit about what typical is from a business perspective. Uh, and Scott, this is just me throwing some darts on the board, but and I'm not at all the expert in this area, so I want you to expand on this for me. But the to me, what I see as typical is is a business will, you know, often they'll reflect on the previous year, you know, understand kind of where where they may or may not have hit some marks. Based on that, they'll set some forward goals. They'll establish some ways they're going to kind of evaluate if they're making those goals. But it seems to me that that's 99% of the effort that most businesses put into, you know, it, implementing systems and enhancing, enhancing systems or setting goals. And they tend to stop there. Um, I don't see a lot of activity beyond this. And to me, it feels like that's where a lot of this breaks down for businesses. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. I think these are three heavy ones, though. Um, you can write, you know, a blog or pages or chapters, if you will, on all three of these. Um, I think part of it is you need to be intentional. As intentional as you are with your estimating or everything else that you do, um, reflect on the previous year. It doesn't mean, you know, during Christmas break or whatever, you're kind of thinking about it going, man, I'd really like a new truck or hey, I'd really like to, uh, you know, expand into commercial or whatever. It's looking back and hopefully you had some, an annual plan last year. If not, then you just need to look through metrics that you're going to be doing this year and see how well you did. But how well did we really do? And it's going to come down to your specific goals and your budget. And the budget doesn't lie. You can make reasons for it, sometimes excuses, sometimes just reasons. But, uh, hey, we didn't get the storms or we didn't. To, to me, that's that's important, but it clouds your mind and mm -hmm. gives you an excuse. And what you want to do is, is you know, be really uh, transparent and, and look at everything and, and maybe have a couple of outside sources help you look so that they see the things that you're not seeing. And uh yeah. Our mouths are right close to our nose, but we can't smell our own breath. You have you have to have uh, somebody else help you with that. Never refuse a mint is 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 the mantra I go by. But, um, <laughs> no, I, I, I heard something just to throw it in there. You made me think of something I heard on the radio the other day. There were there was an interview of uh, Seahawks. I got thrown my Seahawks, but uh, Seahawks quarterback Geno Smith, and they were talking to him a little bit about his performance and everything. And and he stopped the interviewer and said, "You know what? Men lie, women lie, numbers don't." <laughs> so when you start, you're talking about the uh, you know the budget and and the metrics against your performance and the and the balance sheet the numbers don't lie it reminded me of that quote because it's so true right at the end of the day we can we can say anything that we want to say but the numbers don't lie so the bottom line is if you're in business you made it through the year you were successful how yeah. successful were you that's different yeah and so it's it's not an exercise in beating yourself up or trying to be humble or whatever it's just how do I get as accurate a look as possible? We talk about Geno Smith, but all of the best athletes, uh, especially Olympians, it's it's 100% accountability. What can I do? Yes, there's lots of stuff in the world that I can't control. I can't worry about that unless there's contingency planning. But I've got to look at what I've done and be really honest and open about where you've got weaknesses and where you've got strengths. Yeah, and Raphael threw a great question into the, the Q&A. A great reminder for everybody to do the same. So thank you, Raphael, for being the first. But his question is, what are some practices you recommend to snap out of a lemming mentality? Uh, and I, I can kind of seed that a little bit, and then and then I'd love to flip it over to you, Scott. But I'll seed that a little bit with something I said a moment ago. You know, I think, to me at least, one of the, the largest ways of doing that is to not make the assumption uh, that you are going to market as the same business, as the same product, um, or even in the same business climate as you were five, six, seven, eight years ago. The change is a constant, right? Something my dad used to always hit me over the head with is that, you know, change is the one inevitable thing that you can always count on. And if you go into those discussions and thoughts and plannings, uh, you know, understanding that that things are not the same, things are different, they are changing. Uh, and if you don't understand what those changes are, you're missing it. 
All right, you didn't find it, so keep looking. What has changed? And therefore, how do you have to change the business to compensate? I think that's a good first step. Um, so Scott, how do you feel? How do you break out of that lending mentality? Yeah, I think it goes back to who you're looking at and what you're trying to become. And uh, I, th I think it's fear-based if it's getting in your way. Um, just to be real frank, everybody has fear. I don't care who you are. And you go to bed at night sleeping or you're laying in your bed thinking about the things that have to happen to make your business. When we first started Client Runner, I told my wife, she says, what do you think? I said, I'm super excited, but I may not have a job in a month. And it seemed like for every month, I felt that way for, for the first year. Like, yeah, we're doing great. We did another month. Let's, what can we do? And I, and I know you go to bed at night thinking about what can I do? And if there's somebody that's doing well, especially somebody that you connect with or they're charismatic, you're like, I got to do what they're doing. All you're doing is taking your company and handing it to them. And even that's not very good because nothing's formal and they don't even know that you're doing it. So they're not giving you all the picture that you need. You're getting partial pictures. So I think to get out of the lemming mode, you've got to take on the, the mantle and say, I am the captain now, right? You're, I'm, I'm going to run this thing and uh, I'm not going to be afraid. Yes, fear is going to come in, but I'm going to put it to the side and do what we need to do. Then when you're seeking help, I think you're looking and asking questions in a more uh, specific way, so which, which leads into goals. What are you trying to become? What are you trying to do? And those goals and those metrics will tell you if the advice you're getting is helping you or if the advice you're getting is getting in your way. Absolutely. And, and you know, just to, to really sober how important that topic is, I want to share just a couple of metrics uh, related to business at large, at least in the United States. Um, this comes from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, I found this remarkable, and I'd seen it before, and I'm sure many of you have, but I think anytime you're talking about just how important it is to really spend time you know, analyzing and understanding your business as a system, as a machine, uh, and every part and every cog in that machine, I think ownership of this comes from the top all the way through, straight through to what's happening in the field, that we all own a part of, of making sure we understand this, um, is that a lot of businesses, quite frankly, don't succeed, right? Uh, and according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, after two years, you only have, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 80% of businesses, you know, still standing two years into their life. After five years, you're at about 50%. After 10 years, you're sitting down at about 35%. And at 15 years, you're all the way down in the 20s. Um, and it's just, it's a, a constant, you know, decline in the success of those businesses over time. And to me, what this really speaks to is it speaks to just how important it is to understand that whole lemming mentality that we were talking about a moment ago, you know, that we can't be who we were when the business originated. We can't be who we were two years ago in the business. We have to constantly challenge ourselves to understand what has changed about the market I serve, what has changed about even my core competencies, right, and what I'm capable of providing as a product, and how do I adapt that to become the most successful business I can today? right in today's climate. So any thoughts there that you want to add, Scott? Uh, just one thought, and it kind, of, it kind of relates to everything, but we're talking to business owners here, and we're talking to technicians, and we're talking to general managers, and we're talking to potentially admin. I just, uh, I, I just know your, your uh, audience is fairly diverse. Mm -hmm. And so what I don't want to have happen that, I'm, that I feel might be happening a little bit is we're just talking to owners and not everybody on the call. Uh, First of all, everybody needs to have an owner mentality. You own your role. You own your, your yep. team. You own your spot. And you should be trying to make that spot the best. We call it magnifying your role. How do I magnify? How do I get better? If you're trying to get better, you're going to be happier. If you're trying to coast through or just not get in trouble or keep your head down so you don't get uh, taken out, you're not going to be happy and you're not going to be super valuable to the company. So whether you're, you're the owner or you're a technician, or you're in any role in the company, you need to look at that role and think, how do I bring value to the table? How, how do I add value to this company? And whether you're in that company for one year, five years, 10 years, it won't matter because those, those traits will carry with you. And being part of something successful is part of its own reward. And, and the, the, the money will come, the, the roles will come, but uh, it goes back to having a vision for your area of responsibility whether that's uh, the whole country or one city or one household, doesn't matter. Yeah, you know, in the, in the next set of numbers here, I guess kind of relate to that a bit, Scott. So let me flip over to the next graph here. But uh, let me first just throw the numbers out there and then let's talk about how that rolls into exactly what you were saying. You know, businesses 
and their ability to successfully achieve goals do correlate to business success. Um, if you take a look at this graph, this is the number of businesses as a percentage that achieve at least a portion of the goals that they set every year. And what's interesting is, is it's very similar to the success rate of businesses on an annual basis. Uh, very, very similar in the amount. Now, a small percentage accomplish all of their goals. And it's very difficult, I think, especially if you're really challenging yourself as a business to accomplish all of your goals. But those that at least partially succeed, uh, that correlates very closely with businesses that, that tend to be successful year over year. And goals are only accomplished one way, right? They're only accomplished if the business is committed to those goals. It's not, it's not a goal that's on a piece of paper that's posted up on a wall saying, you know, here's the sales number we're going to hit, right? And in fact, I think that's, that's, a, that's a very large failure in a goal if that's the only thing the business is tied around. It's understanding what the business is trying to achieve, right, and getting everybody behind that. That's that's largely a leader's role is is setting that vision and 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 then getting buy-in. You have to have everybody bought in. If they're not bought in, then it's your goal and they're going to try to help you achieve your goal, but they don't care. And, yeah. you know, honestly, they don't care. They want their check. They want to go forward. If you haven't bought into a mission, and by the way, you're going to lose those employees at some point because number one, above money and everything is engagement and sense of purpose, especially for the the uh more recent generations. I think there's five generations in the workplace right now, but um, the, the, the more and more people that come, the more important it is to have a purpose and to be bought into something. So if you're not getting buy-in at all levels from your goals, whether it's a team or the, the whole company, you're going to, you're going to be pushing uphill. That, and which is a perfect segue. So now let, let's really get behind the mechanical. All right. And talk about, you know, the things that really feed into successful implementation, whether it's, you know, goals or a strategy or a system. And we're going to break these out in buckets. And I think this is where we can really expand on the conversation about how every role in the business plays a critical part to whatever a business is trying to implement. As we get into these, again, a reminder, any questions you've got for either Scott or I as we go through this, don't hesitate to drop them into the question and answer area. So let's let's kind of break these out and unpack these. I've got four different areas that we want to kind of spell these out in. The first is, now let's throw these at you, Scott, lack of commitment from the top. Why do we fail in implementation of goals or strategies or systems? Lack of commitment from the top. What does that say to you? To me, that's uh, seeding your authority, just like looking to somebody to kind of pattern yourself after. You can't just give your whole company over to that notion. Um, same here, here. If if the if the commitment's not there from the top, you're seeding everything and hoping it works out. And maybe you got a great general manager, and so you're just kind of letting them run things, and then you come in and out. First of all, it's it's very uh, disruptive when you come in and out. They're running for for two or three weeks, and then you come back from the Bahamas or wherever and say, "Hey, I've been I've got all these ideas. We're going to do this," and then you take another trip, and you're, "Hey, I went to this business conference." we're going to do all this. And so you're not really leading. You're not committed. One of the products we have is Luxor. A lot of, a lot of people on this call will probably be familiar with Luxor, but it's not a typical CRM. It's a uh, relationship-based marketing tool. And you have to buy into the philosophy, not just the tool. The tool is there to enable the philosophy. And we require that the business owner be a champion and be in all the meetings. And I mean, it's the sales side, and that's always a problem for salespeople. They're like, the business owner doesn't want to do that. They want their GM to do that. But um, I ha happen to know we will we will walk away from a contract before we we allow that to happen yeah. because it will fail. Yeah. If if the top is not bought in and in and uh, driving things, the rest of the company is not going to do it. Mm. You know, and, and kind of expand on that because I think this is a great great point. Where I've seen success in 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 any major implementation in the businesses I've been a part of is when I have lost count of the number of times that you know the CEO or the president of an organization has reinforced, acknowledged, called out, awarded even uh, those that are excelling towards the implementation of that goal or that objective. Um, I'm going to use uh, you know our you know, CoreLogic as an example, uh, and talk a little bit about Garrett Gray for a moment. Um, you know, as you know, and many, many of you probably have no familiarity with this, so I'll give you a little behind the curtains view. But uh, one of the things that Garrett does is that on a weekly basis, he pulls together the entire organization and calls out 
uh, you know, the accomplishments towards whatever the goals are set for that year, which is remarkable for a large organization to commit that kind of time towards that. But because of that, I've lost count of the number of times you know, that employees have been called out for and, and acknowledged for the efforts that they're making towards goals and objectives. That's a massively, massively powerful commitment from the top. And it, and it really drives the business. Uh, I've also had experiences where, uh, you know, I've been aware of a strategic initiative or a goal or an objective of an organization. And I heard it once, and it, it was somewhere near the beginning of the year or maybe in the last quarter of the previous year. And the next time I heard it is when the company was being evaluated against it, <laughs> you know, after the, the accomplishment right, of right. the year or whatever. A lot of mission st statements are that way. Yeah, out, and, and that doesn't work, right? It doesn't work. And in between, I'll, I'll be honest with you, in my experience, in between doesn't work. You know, that level of commitment needs to be something that, that is poured passionately from the top. And I'll say that again, poured passionately from the top, because that's the energy that's going to roll through the organization. So if you can't get to the point as, as business leadership where, where you're thinking about it, you're dreaming about it, and, and you've, I mean, you've got a relationship with it to the point that it becomes a part of how you manage the organization, it's destined to fail. It's destined well, to you fail. You talk about, um, Sharpening the saw, Stephen Covey thing. Yep. My my uh, in law family, my wife's family is all they're all tree trimmers, and I've been out with them. And you literally cannot keep cutting very well at all if you don't stop and sharpen that saw. Yeah. And uh, and it 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 makes total sense to do. But you talk about Garrett. Um, when I was competing with Garrett, we got an email. You know, people. You know, people. You have friends in the business, and they show you stuff. And I saw an email where. Um, next year sent out an email to all their customers saying, Hey, apologize if, is it, if this is inconvenient, we're going to keep a support staff on, but we're shutting down for a week, first week of December. And I was like, what, how does that happen? And, you know, I was more the entrepreneur that was just like, I'm going hard every day and I kind of have long range goals, but all I'm trying to do is hit that next target, next target, next target. Yep. And I just thought, okay, so you're not going to sell anything for that week. You're not going to build anything for that week. Like, how do you possibly shut down for a week? Um, and it was an investment. But uh, at the time, I thought it was a mistake. The more years I've spent around Garrett, uh, his mistakes seem to, to, to work out extremely well. Um, but that was a lesson that I learned in leadership of being willing to invest in your people and invest in your structure to, to go through and do an audit of your systems. You know, how are they working? Having a data plan. I know, I know we're going to talk about data at some point. But uh, being willing to make that investment, and he doubled down by by shutting things almost all the way down outside of support and a few other critical functions. But um, and it works. You got buy in from the people um, you talk to. Any employee that's ever worked for Garrett, whether they left for good reasons or bad reasons or whatever, everyone says they love working for Garrett and they loved working at Next Gear. And yeah. uh, we have a lot of founders that are still at the company because of yeah. that. And and it, and again, I think it's it's just and the only reason reason we bring in that example is just to show, you know, it's just a great example of how important it is to have that pour down from the top. But it's it's not pouring down from the top by just you know hitting the hammer over you know the same statement over and over again and and you know an author authoritarian totalitarian author authoritarian whatever have you say that uh, method of of trying to force that objective down through the organization. Um, you got to put a positive light on it by really reinforcing and acknowledging those wins towards uh, whatever objective you have set for your organization um, another quick and do example. that religiously. Sorry, Brandon. N another quick example is uh, is your systems. You're saying, hey, we're going to go paperless. We're going to do this. And then you have a quick question. And it's just a quick question. So you call your technician. What did you just teach them? Oh, I don't have to put stuff in the system. I'll just call him. Or he'll call mm -hmm. me and we'll be done. It's uh it's are you as the owner committed to looking at reports, you know, the whip report or whatever you're gonna look at each week, the marketing reports, are you gonna sit down and use those reports as gospel? And Which is a great segue into the next one, Scott. It's perfect. <laughs> a failure to execute. Um yeah, so I mean, whatever that system is and whatever the plan is to execute on that system, um, this is another area. You talk about sharpening the saw, you talk about you know, pouring down from the top, whatever that plan is, whatever that that goal is to achieve those objectives, you have to execute against it. And execute isn't a one time operation, right? You know, this is a continuous, continuous execution against those objectives. It's a marathon, not a sprint. 
Yeah. So failure to execute is, is I, I would say probably, and these, you could almost say that these are kind of an order of, 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 you know, probably their impact. Uh, but failure to execute is really close to that lack of commitment from the top, although they're interrelated, right? If if we don't have that strong commitment, then the machine is not going to execute. And the machine, all the cogs and the wheels and all the parts and pieces of that organization, if they don't feel you know that that true level of commitment from the organization, that machine is not going to execute against those objectives because it's hard, right? If you're really setting the goals and objectives for your organization to truly drive change in your organization and become something greater, better, or different than it was before, it's not going to be an easy process. It's in, in, in a point, it's going to have some pain and it's going to have some angst. Uh, so continuing that process of execution is going to be a challenge. And those that, that come against it and think, or don't anticipate the level of challenge that it's going to to bring to bear, um, aren't going to be ready to execute against that challenge. Well, it may be that uh, they got the goals wrong. Um, you, you want to, so when you're moving, you know, you're thinking three to five years or you're trying to do something, you think, okay, how long is it going to take us to get from point A to point B? Well, it's probably three years. Then you have to ask the question, how do we do that in one year? And so you start getting, you know, the big, hairy, audacious, the BHAG goals and, uh, that is really important. But when you set your budget and you set your plan for the year, you have to have some very specific goals and then you can have stretch goals. And then you can have high stretch goals. When you're negotiating, a thing I learned a long time ago is wish, want, walk. Know, know what you're trying to achieve, know what you're willing to take and know where you're going to walk away. There's got to be some non-negotiables in your plan and in your goals. And so I think the top two reasons for failure to execute execute are probably cash flow, poor management of cash flow, and then not uh, an accountability. Are we holding people accountable when things aren't going the way we want them? Are we looking at it and being honest and saying, hey, we've missed the mark three weeks in a row or three months in a row or whatever it is, because that jeopardizes the whole year. It cascades out and it makes you know, all of a sudden you're, you got to have a hockey stick to for, to get any goal by the end of the year. Um, so I, I think I think. Uh, Beginning with the end in mind, another covey, covey thing, but I look at it more like a, a, a golf analogy. If you golf at all, um, most golfers go out and hit the ball as hard as they can, hit the ball as hard as they can, get close to the hole, put it on the green, and then try to put it in. Um, great golfers, and I'm not even talking about the pros. I'm talking about you know the, the people that are breaking 90 and breaking 80 on a regular basis. They look at the hole and think, okay, where do I want to come in from? Which side? How many yards? realistically i'm good at 100 yards so i think i can get to 100 yards if i if i put these two clubs together and you plan it and so what is our company going to look like this time next year i use this one a lot um okay by this time next year it also takes a little pressure off you say i want to look like this these are the things i want to do there's how much money i want to have in the bank um you know whether, whether there's equipment that we want to get to and use and then you backfill your plan well how do we get to that and if if you're executing to the point that you're jeopardizing that plan and pushing it out, and now it's become impossible or without drastic measures, um, you're going to fail to execute and it's going to impact every piece of your business. Yeah, my, my golf game I describe as grip it and rip it, Scott. That's, that's me. <laughs> that's my biggest problem. Yeah, yeah. And my problem is I've seen myself with the most perfect, beautiful, long drive once in about a thousand attempts. So I try to do it every time. <laughs> well, and you're like, when it happens, you're like, see, that's it. Yeah. It's not those mm. nine out of 10 shots. It's that one. That's who I am. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's fine so, unless you want to run a business based on how you play golf. And then you got to get a little more serious about uh, actually measuring who you are and actually getting better. Yeah. Well, I, I hope my, my business success is never akin to my <laughs> golf success. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would be scary. Here. So the next one on the list here is really relates a lot to tying this into how important it, it is to you know, engage the business as a whole. Uh, but another big point of failure in implementation is a lack of or no employee empowerment, right? And and again, here I want to start with you know kind of my own experiences a bit. Um, but I've been very very fortunate as as an employee uh, to experience you know two organizations that really focus on really an, an entrepreneurial feel throughout the organization, no matter where in the organization you are. And I can go all the way back to, you know, even in my, my early days in manufacturing, um, you know, really empowering those that were performing a, a, you know, a, a 
a system or performing a, you know, a step in a process and really empowering them to understand here's the objective and we need you because you're the expert, the one at that point in that assembly line or in that particular position in the field, you're the expert for understanding the reality of the challenges we face. So you are also responsible for identifying the opportunities and owning that opportunity uh, to help us improve the way that we do things to achieve this goal and really empowering the, you know, the employee, the, you know, the line worker, the, the field technician, the, uh, the project manager to understand and own and be the expert of that process to the extent that they can be the ones bringing forward the opportunity for improvement and change. Uh, and then measuring against that opportunity, rewarding the identification of those opportunities, uh, and uh, especially those that, that end up fulfilling an accomplishment towards the goal. And that really creates a lot of empowerment you know, at the employee level, uh, which is critical because if as an employee, I don't understand what the objectives are, how I impact those objectives and how I play a role, and then in turn, don't get acknowledged for successfully, you know, uh, executing against that role that I serve, um, then you lose that empowerment, you lose that engagement. And that's the engine, right? Those are the cogs that make it work. And that's where we need the passion for what we're setting as the priority. So you have used the word passion a few times. I think passion has to come through uh, and employees will feel that they're going to pick up the energy of, of the uh, most powerful person in the room, typically. And um, if you're an owner, that's you. If you're a team leader, that's you. And so you've got to bring the energy for sure. I think uh, there's three things I wrote down while you were talking. One is clarity. Um, you have to be clear on expectations, what's expected and what the accountability process is going to be. But you also have to make uh, make make the uh, the team or the employees feel comfortable enough to make a mistake and uh that's it, a good point it's it's the, it, there's a thing called regression to the average mean that i learned as a baseball coach and uh basically if you've got a, a shortstop that's a level of six they're going to miss some balls that's why they're a six and not an eight right mm -hmm. and but if they miss a ball in the game in the moment do you um yell at the kid do you like berate them? Do you sub them out and put somebody in? I actually saw that one time. It was horrifying to see, but uh, it's a different team, not ours. But uh, when they, in a game, what you're trying to do is get them to play at a seven or above. So on a daily basis, you're wanting your team to execute to whatever standard they are. And, but it seems like sometimes you expect it to be too high. And so um, your goal for the season, you know, for the year is to get them to go from a six to a seven, mm -hmm. six to an eight. And then over their, you know, their career, you want to get them to go from a six to an eight or a nine, maybe even get a 10 out of there and they go to college. That baseball team I coached, we, we traveled all over the West and those kids won two state championships. They all went to the same high school and two of them are playing college ball right now. Um, not because of us, they ended up getting progressive, you know, more and more progressively uh, skilled teaching and coaching, but, but that's the game. It's, it's in the moment. Let your employees make mistakes. So cl being clear, asking for their opinions and not just asking. Uh, that's the worst thing. That's like you go and you, everyone checks a box. Yes, I read this. Yes, I agree. Yes, that's my goal. It can't be like that. You got to ask them. They are the domain experts. This is what we're trying to accomplish. This is what we think we can do. Are we on track here? And if they're like, no. So, for example, I was a salesperson at a large company and every year they wanted to raise our quotas by 50%. And I'm like, yeah. I can't do that. Like, I just busted my tail to get this quota. This is, it was so daunting. What they could have done was say, hey, what are our big opportunities? And then if we stretched, you know, what would it take? If, they, if you change and just say, what would it take to hit this goal? Now they're engaged. They say, well, it's a different part of your mind. You're going to start problem solving. Mm -hmm. You know, well, it would probably take this or, you know, what? it's going to take more money. Great. I can solve that. What else do you need? What else do you need to be successful? Or maybe it's going to take more money. Okay, we don't have more money, so how are we going to do it? And you just keep asking. You ask at least three different times because the first answer is going to be, I don't know, work harder. You know, I don't know. But if you engage and dig three different times, tell me why. Tell me why. Tell me why. Tell me more about that. They will engage. And once they engage, now they're bought in. Yep. And uh, it doesn't matter if it's your whole company or your whole team or, or just you. You can ask yourself these same questions. How am I going to hit my goals? How am I going to bring value? And start going going that direction. And then the last thing was just you've got to figure out um, decision level authority, and you got to let the decisions be made at the lowest level possible. Mm -hmm. You can't have every decision coming up to the top 
that's a huge bottleneck. So there are some decisions that you say, okay, if, if you're going to this level, I need to be involved or your superior needs to be involved, but can you let them make some decisions? Another thing we said in baseball all the time was make a decision, even if it's wrong, just make a decision. Yep. And then we can correct from there. And uh, yeah. as long as there's trust and it's a, you know, an atmosphere of safety, that's going to work. You're going to correct those mistakes because everybody wants to do better ultimately. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, there's a, a great question that came in uh, by Saida. Uh, how do you get people from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset? And I want to take your question, Saida, and kind of relate that into what Scott was just saying, because I think that is a mistake that a lot of businesses make is understanding how important it is um, when you have an employee that is making mistakes, um, but they're making mistakes by 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 trying, right? By by getting out on the limb and putting in the effort to try to move you from the as is to the growth, right? They're trying new things. They're they're putting a lot of energy into it. I think a sports analogy is great uh, because I've grown up uh, as an adult, at least as a parent. Um, my kids have all gone through through sports, and soccer is the big sport in, in our family. Um, and uh, when I really start to see you know, my kids really begin to really grow and excel in that area is when they finally got a coach that said, you know what, if you're not making mistakes, you're not trying hard enough. And that was that was the mantra, right? If you're not making mistakes, you're not trying hard enough. Uh, but it reminded me of something that a gentleman that I, I worked for for a time, a guy named Jim Myers, who was kind of the uh, really the catalyst behind the growth of education at the time behind Legend Brands. Um, he had a, another mantra that he would always share with me, and that is that I don't care if you make mistakes, as long as when you make a mistake, you come to me with the mistake and a solution, right? How are you going to learn from that? What are we going to change? How are yeah. you going to grow? And if you can come at me and say, you know what, I made this mistake, and here's what I'm going to do different next time, and here's how we're going to grow because of it, he says, not only does that tell me that you're trying and that you're honest, right? Uh, but it also tells me you know, that you've got the mindset that this organization needs to grow. That's the mindset we need. Um, and he, that, was, that was a very core part of, of, of what he kind of administered as a, a leader in the organization. Make the mistakes, but then identify the mistake. Claim the mistake. Own the mistake. And tell me what we're going to do differently next time. And that's all healthy, right? That's all healthy. So to kind of come back to your question, uh, Saida, about how do you get people from a, you know, a fixed mindset to a growth mindset, I think a big part of it is, is – is not coming down hard on on those mistakes. You know, challenge people to to the fact that if you're not going to make if you don't make a mistake every once in a while, you, you're probably not trying hard enough. But maybe it's not even mistakes; it's just fail, right? As long as you're trying new things, and maybe that method to get us there didn't work, so let's let's modify it. Let's learn from that. Let's do something different next time. I think that the biggest mistakes and the biggest failures are the ones that are repeated. That's that's kind of the, that that cancer that can set in is when we're not learning from those things and uh, and and the last point too and before we move on Scott you know, when you're talking about empowerment and the decisions being made at a lower level the one thing I wanted to add to that which again relates to that same question is I think another big mistake that organizations make is by micromanaging those decisions too high up the chain you also bring away that decision from the context it needs. Right. A lot of times the person at that point that's impacted by that decision knows a lot more about that decision than people that are higher up the chain. And you have to acknowledge that, admit that and trust in that. Right. And if you don't trust in the ability for the, the decision to be made at the point of action, you're communicating um, that that power is not supposed to be there. Right. And that depowers doesn't empower it, depowers the organization pretty quickly. Deflates and yeah, yeah. totally. So on the growth mindset, first thing I would say is make sure that you have a growth mindset and not just think you have a growth mindset. So, so double down on making sure that you have a growth mindset. If you want your, your company to have a growth mindset, it's got to start with you. If you want your team to have a growth mindset, it's got to start with you. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say this quickly in about two minutes, and I can I actually taught a class on this that took an hour, so I'm going to try to like pare it down, but command and control is gone. Our grandparents, our parents taught us command and control. But think about it. They went through like a couple of world wars, Korean War, Vietnam War. There was all kinds of stuff that they went through where you're trying to get things in extreme drastic measures to happen. Emergency mode is great. We want everyone to double down, but that can't be your plan. It's a contingency, That's a contingency plan. But your strategy and your plan, it's, uh, it's getting them into a growth mindset is all about influence. In today's market, you can't come out of control. You have to influence. And the number way, one way to influence um, anyone is to connect with them. 
And there's lots of ways I can talk about how to connect, but you have to connect and emp employee empowerment is part of how you're connecting. You're, you're treating them with respect for their role. Um, they don't have the final decision, but there's some decisions they, they can make. And you're asking them, how would we solve this problem? You may not already know the answer or you think you know the answer, but listen to them. How do you solve the problem? You might get some good things out of it, or you might understand where they're going off. Go, okay, that makes sense. If you're thinking this way, I've introduced this stuff. I probably didn't tell you about very well. It goes back to clarity. So um, influence is the key and connections, the key to influence. So, and, and you could probably relate some of what you just said to this question, but we had a great question come in on empowerment. I want to throw at you, Scott. How do you own it and turn the ship around if you've made a mistake by not empowering your team? How do you write so, that ship? It, it's situationally, you'd have to you'd have to you know take this with a grain of salt because there's different ways in. The, the bottom line is you've got to find a way into the interstate. You can't come if you're if you're merging on to uh, we have interstate here I-15. But if you're merging on, I always tell my kids you can't go at a 90 degree angle. Someone's going to get hurt, and it's actually probably you because those cars are coming really fast. <laughs> You've got to find a way to merge in. So if you've not been empowering and you want to change things, I think the tendency would be, let's have a big meeting. I'm going to fall on my sword. I'm going to cry a little bit. We're going to arouse the team and we're going to get everybody to know it's a new day. That There may be a time for that. That may be important. But I think that's something that you're doing to more um, soothe yourself than you are actually to, to fix the situation. Um, you got to sit back and look, okay, where are we not doing things? And then start having conversations with people, start connecting and start empowering and feather it in, merge onto that road, so to speak. And three months from now, you could have a big meeting and say, hey, you may have noticed we've changed a few things around here. Yeah. Here's what I'm trying to do. Here's why I did it. And here's where we're going. And now you're coming from a position of strength instead of mm -hmm. looking for everyone to make you feel better about a mistake and then maybe getting empowerment, maybe not. Yeah. So begin by showing examples of empowerment, right? Start start making it happen. Start doing it. Yeah. And, and doing tell it. them why you're doing it. Yeah. Uh, you know, great, there great are situations example. where you probably need to have a, a hard stop. So you're not losing half your employees. You know, I'm not saying you can't do that, but uh, given the preference, I would prefer to, to merge it in and then talk about it. Perfect. All right. And that brings us mechanically into the fourth item here that we want to talk about that is a failure of implementation. And that's just junk data. Uh, and I can say a lot about junk data on the technical end. Um, you know, some of it is one of our industry's big dark secrets sometimes. Uh, but junk data as it comes to implementation of systems, uh, you're you're sunk before you start if the data is junk, right? You sunk with the junk. I like that. You better go copyright that. Get it on a T-shirt. <laughs> but uh, yeah, data. So uh, I actually will tell people they need to have a data plan and um, finally, I had someone raise their hand up and say, "What is a data plan? <laughs> what is that?" But you have a you have a financial plan, right? It's primarily circular, um, focused around the budget, but you have a financial plan, and uh, there are other aspects that that feed into that budget and and management of all your cash flow and your money and and what you're trying to do. Um, you have a sales plan. You have an operational plan. You got to have a data plan, and uh, what that looks like can be different for each company, but the, the, the primary point is to be intentional about your data and have a periodic basis where you go and do cleanup. Maybe you got some duplicates in there. What happens is if it gets worse and worse and worse, you become like a hoarder and you can't walk in there and people don't want to be there and it smells bad. And um, with, with regard to systems, what happens is people stop using the system. They work around it. It's like, I don't know if you've ever seen, I saw a picture one time in a field that was perfectly uh, plowed. You know, it was a massive field. It was beautiful, all these rows. Um, and uh, there was a big tree in the middle that they just went around. <laughs> it's like, and I get that that was probably one they did want to go around. It was taking so much time to get rid of that tree. But um, don't just go around things. You gotta, you gotta stop and solve it. And data is your number one thing in today's world. Uh, the reason our company is valuable is because of our data. There's a lot of tools that we have, a lot of things. But what really anchors us in is the data. We we own the MLS. We we have property data now that we can bring to bear for our customers. Um, most of your bigger companies right now are doing data plays. When you look and we peel everything back, it's data, data, data. And if you want to run your company well, you can't have a system that relies on data and not clean up your data because what happens, people start picking up the phone again. They work around it. I heard, I heard, uh, I actually read as I was doing a little bit of research and around business, uh, you know, success and failure. 
I saw a phrase, um, and I wish I could quote exactly where I saw it, so I apologize I can't, but um, the phrase that I saw and it stuck with me is, the worst thing you can do if your data stinks is plug your nose. <laughs> <laughs> that really yeah, stuck with or, me. But that's what we do as humans. That's yeah. what you do. You think, I'll get to it later. I'm going to get to it. They say, you know, the old joke is the, the contractor's homes are the, the, in the most disrepair because they don't have time to fix it. They're too busy over here. And so you got to do it. Yeah. And this really, it needs to be a really a core proficiency in this industry, because think about how important data is to us on, on the, the product side of what we do, right? You know, we are, we are base, basing everything that we do from liability to performance on the data we collect in the field, right? That data is so, so uber critical to ensuring that we're properly drying structures, that we're properly restoring structures or remediating. Um, and that data has to be solid, right? It has to be reliable, it has to be honest, right? Um, and I've I've always spent a lot of time. I, I know a lot of folks uh, that I've spoken to in my career, you know, have some fear about you know collecting that data and letting that data you know say what happened on a mitigation project. But my argument is always, you know, if if the first 24 hours of data and drying a building says that it didn't dry, oh well, right? What did you do next? And use right. that to support the next decision you make. That's justification for the next decision you're making on the project. And so always admit the honesty of that data in your documentation, but then act on it, right? Take the appropriate action and use that data as a launching point for the decisions that you're making. Uh, because the reality of our industry is that everything you do in mitigation is, is, a, is a guess, right? It's an educated guess, it's a hypothesis, uh, but I'll tell you, even, even from my experience, and I've spent the better part of 30 years thinking about nothing but water damage. That's about all I've thought about in my professional career for like 30 years. And I'll tell you right now, when I walk into a building, I'm still guessing, right? If, if that's going to make the performance or progress that I think that it's going to make. But what I'm not doing is I'm not guessing 24 hours later. And that has always stood up to support every decision that I've made and justified every argument that I've ever brought forward in this industry, whether it's with, with an adjuster or with a restorer or with, you know, some of the, the minds and standards as we debate standards. You know, as long as the data is real, then I can stand up the decisions I'm making as a business, whether it's technically or as a system or as a process. What if you have a piece of equipment or somebody putting in weird data? What happens? But then we're going to make wrong decisions, right? And we're going to set ourselves against the wrong target. Um, and then and how, long are you let that happen? how long are you going to let that happen? Well, personally, I, that's not going to happen, right? That's To <laughs> me, that's the mistake. That's the mistake that we're going to correct the moment it does, right? Because that data has to be solid. And that's how you should run data in your company. So yep. ideally, if you've got a hoarder house, hire some people, you know, get it fixed. But you've got to have a, it's got to be a part of your DNA of what you do. We get the data right. Your salespeople put the data in, your techs put the data in, and it's not it questionable. Starts. And if you find out it's questionable, that's like a faulty piece of equipment. At some point, you're going to replace that equipment if you have to. Yep. Or you're going to it's always easier to fix than replace. You're going to fix that equipment if you can. But uh, at some point, you can't tolerate it. If you tolerate it, it goes back to some of our other comments, but if you tolerate it, you're going to fail. And you're going to be one of those statistics that Brandon showed earlier, where the bar gets yeah. smaller and smaller of the people that are still in business after 5, 10, 15 years. You gave me a, another wonderful segue, Scott. So why, <laughs> why do some businesses effectively establish goals and power you know, employees behind those goals, but still end up failing even when they accomplish and, and achieve those goals. So let's, let's talk about the other side of that coin for a second. You can effectively as an organization establish a goal, achieve a goal, empower your employees behind that goal, but still end up failing. And, and one of the reasons that can happen is that, and it's something that we didn't really hit on for hard in the beginning, so I wanna close with it really hard. You have to ensure that the system you're committing to, the goals that you're setting are the right systems and goals for your organization. So how do you how do we understand that? How is an organization, we can, and you can be specific on this one, Scott, talk specifically about the mitigation industry if you'd like, but but how does a mitigation company or a, a restoration company ensure that they're setting the right goals for their organization? I think the first thing is to um, kind of figure out what's within your control. But I don't know if you've ever heard in the uh, in politics or 
other places they talk about moving the goalposts in sales it happens a lot you've got this target and then you think uh we're, we're going to move you, you don't move the goalposts you move the players by the way it'd be really hard to move a goalpost but so you, you just say oh, I, you know we weren't trying to hit 50 yarder we're trying to hit a 30 yarder well oh, we're trying to hit a 20 yarder what does that do to your plan of where you're trying to go as a company and what does it do to your cash flow what does it do to your ability to hire more resources or add more equipment um you know for sales it's it's that's the lifeblood that's the oxygen you've got to have yeah. revenue in order to build this thing and you want to build a big raging fire not a little one that's smothered all the time so i think the first thing that came to my mind is moving the target if you keep moving the target and what you're basically doing is shooting your arrow and then somebody's moving the target um you know you might do that if you were an extremely wealthy billionaire like yourself then all your people around you are yes people and they just keep moving the target for you it might feel good but if you're running a business you can't do that you've got to have a clear look you got to have a clear idea of where you're going and you've got to have clear expectations set for your people so that when you hit the targets you're achieving to me it's like the number one reason is you've set the wrong targets or you've changed the targets repeatedly to make yourself feel better or just to say we can't do it any other way so it's just it is what it is it is what it is kills businesses it's not it's not that it's not true but if there's anything you can do about it you got to fight yep I've I've often said in in the technical side of the business, you know, that the wrong response when somebody asks why are you doing it that way is because we've always done it that way. Um, and and what really excited me about the topic that we were able to bring today is it's another way of thinking about that same question because I always think about it from a technical perspective. And in conversations I've had with you, Scott, it, it it really drives home just how important that statement is across the business as a whole. So uh, with that, we're, we're right at the top of the hour. And I want to take a moment, Scott, just to thank you uh, for joining me for this session uh, today. Uh, I'm still working through kind of our lineup for technically speaking throughout the year, but uh, Scott and I are already talking about putting on another session that's going to focus a bit more on the business side later in the year. Uh, so a couple, couple things here I just want to note as we do that is that um, Scott, you've been hugely influential on my ability to think about that side of the business. I want to thank you for that. Uh, and also thank you for taking the time to be with us here today, especially coming right out of Interconnect. I know you were you had a long weekend in, in uh, California uh, just this last weekend. So thank still, you. Still recovering. Thank you. Uh, honestly, though, if you can give us your feedback, mm -hmm. um, not to uh, boost our egos or to, to slap us in the face, be kind, but there's a difference between feedback and complaining. But we would like to know, is this, are some of these business topics mixed in? Is that good? Is this something that you want to hear? Or is it, no, I'm like, why'd you do this? I want to go back to the technical and just do technical. It'd be good to get your feedback on that. And uh, I got one little comment to leave you with from my side is, I always tell my kids, face it and embrace it. You know, business is hard. This industry squeezes the contractor from multiple directions and we get it. But there's 10 other contractors wanting to do what you do. And so if you're going to stay in this business, face it and embrace it. Most people face it, but they don't necessarily embrace it. You got to love what you do. And there's ways Absolutely. I can talk forever about how to love what you do, but you got to love what you do. Um, anyway, I know we're up at the top of the hour. Before yeah. I You'll have no, the, and I use the word passion a lot on purpose, Scott. That's one of my favorite words. Uh, to use as we talk about just human improvement and the human condition as a whole. Um, but you have to love it to have a passion for it, right? If there's no love, there's no passion. Well, you could have a different kind of passion, but it's the wrong kind of passion. So you got to have the love to have the passion. So it's critical that that's there. So with that, we'll kind of wrap things up. Uh, this was Technically Speaking, Implementing Systems and Goals, our first episode here in the second season. Again, my name is Brandon Burton with CoreLogic. Uh, my email address is at the bottom of the screen. Uh, I'm not going to throw Scott's email address up there, uh, but I'm going to put mine up there. Any feedback that you've got on what we covered today and what I'm going to show you next, which is an outline of, of some of what's coming up for the rest of this year, send me an email. If you've got something you want to pick a bone with on standards, technical, uh, technically speaking, anything that I may be of some assistance for, or maybe even just be an ear for so I can pass it to the right direction, please send me an email at brburton at corelogic.com. I would love to hear from you. So let me talk a little bit about where we're going with technically speaking this year before we completely wrap up. 
Uh, here is what I've got so far for season two. The next session we're going to have on February 21st, I'm going to bring in another very good dear friend of mine, a gentleman named Darren Foote. Uh, he is a trainer in the industry. I've trained with Darren for a great number of years. Uh, also has a very strong water, fire, and remediation background. Uh, and we're going to approach the topic of how you can uh, manage internal training at every level in your organization as a recurring and systematic process. So what kind of topics do you want to bring into your water mitt team, your fire mitt team? How do you approach those topics? Uh, if you're the one being asked to present a topic in your organization, how do you approach that? How do you get the most out of that time in your organization? So I'm really excited about uh, approaching that topic with Darren, also a, just a wonderful, wonderful trainer. Here are some other things that we're going to address this year. We're going to break into commercial water damage. I've got experts lined up that I'm lining up rather for all of these that are good friends of mine in the business. So commercial water damage, cat response and cat response preparation. Uh, we're going to have a session specifically on fire damage restoration. Uh, we're going to have a session specifically on remediation. I'm also toying with the idea of bringing in on the water damage side uh, a specific session on hardwood floor restoration, uh, concrete restoration, et cetera. If you've got any feedback on these, again, it's brburton at corelogic.com. Don't hesitate to give me the feedback. And with that, uh, we're right at the top of the hour. Perfect timing. I thank you so much for your time today, for joining us in the second season of Technically Speaking. And again, thank you, Scott, for your time. Thank you. Take care.